Our message this morning is coming from practitioner, life insurance professional, teacher, IT specialist, and lots of other wonderful things. We're grateful and, uh, to have him as part of our spiritual community. And I know that he's going to bring you a message this morning that's full of great insight with much to chew on. Ladies, gentlemen, please put your hands together and welcome practitioner Vance Gardner. Thanks, Sandy. I could just listen to that meditation. I just really just relax into the service this morning. Yeah, it was <laughs> wonderful. I kind of feel like how oh, the Commodores must have felt when they had to come after Bob Marley at a concert. <laughs> you know, when Bob had stolen the show already. You know, I heard that a lot of people left after Bob's performance that day. And oh, good morning, everyone. Good morning, Vance. And good morning to those who are joining us on the World Wide Web and everyone who is joining us in consciousness this morning. The divine plan is one of freedom. Bondage is not God-ordained. Freedom is the birthright of every living soul. All instinctively feel this. The truth points to freedom under law. Thus, the inherent nature of man is forever seeking to express itself in terms of freedom. We do well to listen to this inner voice, for it tells us of a life wonderful in its scope, of a love beyond our fondest dreams, of a freedom which the soul craves. Ernest Holmes wrote these words in the first chapter of the introduction of what we call the textbook the science of mind. Influential German philosopher Hegel claimed that in history, spirit externalizes itself and becomes objective and man's consciousness reaches an awareness of itself. For Hegel, the purpose or goal of history is the progress of the consciousness of freedom, fueled by reason. And he believed that the rational state was the agency for the realization of freedom on earth. Friends, in order to understand and realize freedom, I believe it is best to move from the intellectual understanding to the metaphysical and mystical grasp of freedom, to move from the philosophical to the practical realization and revelation of freedom. Ernest Holmes made this wonderful insight that the seed of freedom must be planted in the innermost being of man. But like the prodigal son, man must make this great discovery for himself. There is no state or type of government that can set us free, or any religion, philosophy, person, or creed we have to make the great discovery for ourselves. Only we can set ourselves free. We are the ones we are waiting for in a manner of speaking. As Garvey told us, emancipate yourselves from mental slavery. None but ourselves can free our minds. Master yoga teacher, Kate Potter put it this way, freedom is not a concept, but an experience felt as our nature shines forth, unburdened, unattached, free of the ego. Freedom, therefore, is a state of consciousness, the consciousness of freedom. All states of consciousness are realized when the intellectual awareness is in alignment with the universal reality we are embodying. And we know spirit is limitless, unbounded, 
unattached, always creating and ever expanding. When we recognize and realize our oneness with spirit, freeing our minds from any ideas, feelings, or experiences of separation and division, then we'll awaken to freedom and be free. The Honorable Douglas Sarain, I saw him earlier, I don't know where he went, <laughs> made a declaration that Jamaica is a state of consciousness at the Jamaica Dispr Diaspora Conference held at the Visitor's Lodge at the UWI. I interpret it to mean that there are ways of thinking, feeling active, and being collectively and individually which are identified as being Jamaican. And what is called Jamaica is the manifestation of this state of consciousness. Today, I am declaring that this state of consciousness is undergirded by the unfolding of our consciousness of freedom, our awakening to and acceptance of our magnificence and that of each other. To me, the brilliance of Holmes' declaration was to take the kernel of truth in Hegel's claim and free it from its roots in duality and ideas of separation, and like Garvey to show us that self-reliance is the way to freedom. I'm therefore going to share with you three practices that can facilitate our awakening to freedom. The first is non-attachment. Not letting things, people, places, ideas, beliefs, thoughts, or even events or experiences own us. You can own and appreciate things, but don't ever let things own you. However, you can't own people, ideas, thoughts, or beliefs, but too often, we let them own us. In Exodus 20, verses 1 to 3, it says that God spoke these words, saying, I am Jehovah, thy God, who brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. We worship God by putting spiritual values first and by taking them as our guide and our motive power. By identifying ourselves with God and letting the divine faculties of life, love, wisdom, faith, and power be expressed in and through us. We shouldn't give our power away by letting things, ideas, beliefs, events, circumstances, or people control us. As we say in Jamaica, we run things things nor on we. You know. In order to do this, we have to free our minds. And meditation allows us to observe our thoughts and to let them go without letting the past or our imagination take us into captivity. We stay in the present moment where there is freedom. A senior monk and a junior monk were traveling together. At one point, they came to a river with a strong current, and a woman asked them to help her to get across it. The two monks glanced at one another because they had taken vows not to touch a woman. Then, without a word, the older monk picked up the woman, carried her across the river, placed her gently on the other side, and carried on his journey. After traveling in silence for several hours, the younger monk, unable to contain himself, said to the older monk, I can't believe that you not only touched that woman, but carried her on your shoulders over the river. The older monk looked at him and replied, Brother, I set her down on the other side of the river. Why are you still carrying her? <laughs> Non-attachment also means being 
non-judgmental and not labeling persons according to physical attributes like race, ethnicity, gender, or their associations, beliefs, and most importantly, any act they may have committed. Emma Curtis Hopkins stated that when we call or see anyone or anything less than divine, we are bearing false witness. Therefore, the ability to observe without judgment or attachment is what is called the unfolding of our witness consciousness, the ability to separate the person from the beliefs and their activities and honor their divinity. <clears throat> Sorry. The second practice, which is related to the first, but in order to choose your thoughts, you have to first become aware of them. And the second practice is discernment. Scripture reminds us to choose this day who you will serve. Will you listen to the inner voice of intuition or will you let your understanding of the prevailing circumstances determine your choice? Our freedom lies in our interdependence and to choose what is in alignment with truth for therein lies our freedom. There is a difference between intuition and the voices in our heads. And being able to, between, to discern between them is very important. The voice of the ego and the voice of the race mind will often deceive you because they arrive largely from a consciousness of separation. So any voice that tells you that you have to have this or that substance, person, or says, tweet, tweet, in the middle of the night, they are attacking you, you are the chosen one, king of Israel, don't listen to that voice. It is not true. If it reminds you, if the voice ever reminds you that there is no separation, you are guided, loved, and in spite of all appearances, all is well. So be still and know, listen to that voice. Even if it tells you to challenge the authority of the British state, as it told me in October 2006. I am in Heathrow Airport in August 2006, coming back to Jamaica, when there is a long line bending and turning and yet still stretching way out into the road. This was orderly chaos as the authorities had instituted new airport regulations based on what they said was the discovery of some terrorist plot the day before targeting transatlantic flights. Passengers were told to get to the airport, I believe, at least three hours or more before our scheduled departure time. <coughs> Sorry. Arriving at least five hours before my flight, I had assumed everything is okay until I saw the lines at the airport and realized that this may not be the case. Some university students were brought in to assist us to ensure that everything ran smoothly. Then I became aware that these arrangements were not working and the students were not as informed as required and it was not wise to follow their instructions blindly. I then noticed that Sizzler was at the airport and he was not in no line and he and his posse seemed cool and collected. And I heard a small voice inside of me said, keep your eye on the Ross. <laughs> so I did just that until I got very hungry and had to get something to eat. And when I returned, the Ross was gone. <laughs> yeah, thanks. And I look up and saw the boarding call for Air Jamaica. And I was nowhere near customs at the time. 
I explained to the student who was nearest to me that I needed to get to customs now because they were boarding my flight. He told me to get back in the line and follow his instructions. Ignoring him, I kept looking forward and I saw a group of people arguing with a customs officer. So I went up there and when I got close, I heard the accent. <laughs> and I know these were the people I should follow. <laughs> Eventually, we were ushered through customs hastily. And when I reached the departure lounge, I heard my name being called, that this was the last call to report or be left behind. Not even a surfer could move as fast as I ran to the bus that was taking us to where the flights were taken off that day. Then it dawned on me when they were doing the final checks that everybody was accounted for. And I said, how could this be, seeing what we had to endure? Then I realized that part of our consciousness of Jamaicans is not to follow rules blindly. <laughs> we may be unruly in a very good way. <laughs> so, so it's not only popcorn is unruly, but uh, as Jamaicans, that's part of us. That's why all our heroes are people, are rebels. Yeah, enlightened rebels, so to speak, as was said earlier in the reading. So the, the third practice is compassion. The Dalai Lama said, if you want others to be happy, practice compassion. If you want to be happy, practice compassion. Jesus, the master teacher said, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. And that's from Matthew 37 to 40. The truth points to freedom under law, as Holmes stated. Therefore, freedom is not license. Freedom is not the ability to do whatever you want. Freedom is the strength of character to do what is good, true, noble, and right. This is according to Matthew Kelly in the Seven Laws of Intimacy. The most compassionate and freeing thing we can do is to forgive. Letting go of the idea and the memory of what someone did that you felt hurt you not only frees you from the pain, but also the conditions you have brought upon yourself by carrying it around. The release also creates the space for a greater expression of yourself. As the Sufi poet Rumi puts it, we are here to be a forgiveness door through which freedom comes. There is no greater embodiment of this truth than the Madiba, Nelson Mandela. It struck me while I was reading Long Walk to Freedom, Mandela autobiographies, autobiography, not Bujo series of show, although it's wonderful to see how the Garma Mail was received. <laughs> In chapter 89, titled Talking with the Enemy, Mandela wrote, that when he was taken into solitary confinement, he then had a revelation that instead of it being a liability, it was an opportunity for him to begin talks with the apartheid regime. The ANC had a policy of no talks with the enemy until they freed all political prisoners and removed their troops from the townships. Mandela wrote, there were times, there, sorry, they, there are times when a leader must move ahead of the flock. Go in a new direction, confident 
that he's leading his people the right way. Knowing that his comrades would not know what he was doing and therefore could not think he was a sellout, Nelson Mandela broke the most rigid of ANC rules and made an offer to begin negotiations with the regime in order that millions of lives may be spared because the ANC and their allies had made South Africa ungovernable and the international sanctions had made the regime desperate. We all know <clears throat> what unfolded and that there was a peaceful transfer of power because Man Mandela followed his intuition, guided by his compassion to spare the unnecessary loss of lives. He's also a model of forgiveness and the truth and reconciliation process that he established allowed South Africa to be the country it is today. But it all could have been different if Mandela had been intractable and blindly followed the ANC position at the time. <clears throat> Sorry. Friends, we are also here to be a forgiveness door through which freedoms come. When we release all our prejudices, misconceptions, labels, rules and judgments that separate us from each other and from ourselves and God at the level of our awareness, <clears throat> then will we awaken to freedom and it will be revealed in our lives and our affairs. It is not complicated to realize freedom. It can be a simple thing. But if we rely on our willpower, it is impossible. Allowing divine guidance from within through non-attachment, being discerning and compassionate, we awaken to our divinity and we recognize and honor it in each other. It becomes simple and effortless when we accept that our greatest glory is not in never falling, but in rising every time we fall. We are all connected, and just how Garvey and our national heroes contributed to our awakening to our consciousness of freedom as we free ourselves and expand our consciousness, we too will be playing our part in awakening the collective consciousness of our fellow Jamaicans and all people. Therefore, let us with compassion allow each other to show up and share our divine gifts without judgment and with humility accepting our oneness with God breaking all chains and rules that no longer serve or never served us. Then, like never before, Jamaicans from a consciousness of freedom can sing in one voice the tr truth revealed about us in the following song that says, and you all know it, you can all probably join in, it says, from riverside to mountain, from the cane field to the sea. Our hearts salute Jamaica, triumphant, proud, and free. Namaste.